Previously on China's rebel city. The people knew that this is so dangerous. Anybody could be just brought back to China for trial. The chief executive was determined to go ahead with it. Lam Zheng who could think Tong Yapal and Saman gets him up to Jacob, Kowai Yakem. There could have been huge casualties to the police. Firing tear gas to disperse protesters on June the 12th was standard riot control for police. But it flipped an anger switch among Hong Kong's anti-government protesters. For them, there was no going back. Solo was one of the hardcore protesters at the front lines of clashes with police. Branded as rioters and criminals by the authorities, he spoke to us on the condition of complete anonymity, fearing arrest and prosecution. July 1st, the anniversary of Hong Kong's return from British to Chinese rule, has been marked every year since the 1997 handover with a protest march. But in 2019, the anniversary would be marked by something unthinkable. The siege and sacking of the Legislative Council, initiated by splinter groups of protesters who broke away from a larger, peaceful march. Protest organizer Jimmy Sham. The crowds outside the building built up into thousands, locked in a standoff with police for hours. Shortly after 9 p.m., the glass walls and doors were breached. It was psychological. That's really equivalent to subverting government. That's very serious. It's not just simple criminal damage. Even Martin Lee, a staunch supporter of the protesters, found it excessive. I said, that is too ugly. Too ugly. Riot police inside the building retreated before the first protesters rushed in. Why they left is a matter that still bothers all sides. As a former security chief and current politician, Regina Ip found it unacceptable. The police um, the performance at that time during the first phase was disappointing. If the police had not abandoned that building at such a crucial stage, none of them could have happened. None of them. That's the reality of the situation. 
Rupert Dover was the police commander on duty with the riot squad on standby at the scene. I had by that stage about 600, 700 officers ready to go, ready to disperse the crowd. Uh, we were never told to do it. Why the decision was made not to do that, I don't know. Um, there were other officers deployed inside LegCo, um, and obviously they have a far better idea about what's happening than I do. But it was frustrating. There was, we had a big team there ready to go and sort this problem out, but we were not deployed. I don't think in any other jurisdiction, any other country, you would allow the seat of government to be invaded, vandalised, literally destroyed. And we did. The trashing of the legislature was a hugely symbolic escalation. For the government, an unacceptable assault on elected authority. For the protesters, a rejection of failed political promises. No rioters, only tyranny, the slogan they left behind. Deputy Police Commissioner Raymond Sue directed operations from headquarters during the first months of turmoil. You cannot just glorify this sort of violence, say by saying that achieving justice by violating the law is okay. No, it shouldn't be. This is ridiculous. People making this sort of statement is irresponsible. A foreign diplomat actually said to me he was very surprised that even after such a traumatic event, the government didn't hit back harder. That sort of action would have amounted to trying to overthrow government. After the sacking of the Legislative Council, a critical turning point came during a mass rally on Hong Kong Island. Some protesters splintered off and made their way to Beijing's liaison office in the city. They vandalized the building facade and defaced the national symbol. The unprecedented insult and challenge to Beijing's authority was a message to China's leaders that this was no longer just a problem confined to Hong Kong and its internal affairs. It laid the groundwork for direct intervention later from the central government that would change everything. What was initially resentment against the police force turned into intense hatred of the men and women in blue. And it all came to a head that same night after the liaison office was vandalized. Footage broadcast on television and shared on social media showed a mob of men in white attacking people with metal rods at the MTR station in Yunlong in the New Territories. They were there to target returning protesters, but their rampage was as indiscriminate as it was brutal. It took police 39 minutes to respond to distress calls. There were lots and lots of incidents uh, going on on that, on that evening. There was another major uh, public event down in Hong Kong Island, so our resources are tight. So when this incident did suddenly pop up in Yuen Long, there's an automatic you know, time 
lag, time delay to get the requisite sort of uh, manpower up there. Was the main bulk of the riot police arrival uh, slow? Yeah, it was, because of the distances concerned. Protesters and their supporters accused police of being deliberately slow to respond. They saw it as proof of collusion between officers and criminal elements among the white-clad mob. Then I, then I knew the communists and the police and these triad people are working together. C can there be any doubt? On August the 5th, Hong Kongers woke up to a city almost completely paralyzed. Protesters called for a citywide strike to escalate their campaign and spread out across Hong Kong to enforce it. Public transport ground to a halt as protesters blocked road traffic. They disrupted train services by stopping carriage doors from closing. Hundreds of flights were cancelled at Hong Kong's international airport as air traffic controllers called in sick at the last minute. At least 10 districts across the city were rocked by violence. And there was much more to come. Petrol bombs became a weapon of choice for the radicals. Police increased their use of rubber bullets and pepper spray and fired thousands of rounds of tear gas at the increasingly angry crowd. The protest movement ramped up efforts to make more global headlines by taking over the arrival hall of Hong Kong's international airport. It was all peaceful at first, but eventually... For the first time, clashes at the airport with horrified international travelers looking on. Their journeys disrupted, hundreds of flights canceled. And ugly scenes like this. The airport drama reached its climax on a night when protesters held a mainland Chinese man hostage, beating him and accusing him of being an undercover policeman. China sent people pretending as press to be out to be undercover. He turned out to be a reporter for a Beijing-based newspaper who was rescued by paramedics. Further chaos erupted as police forced their way into the departure hall to make way for the medics. When it was all over, the protesters realized they'd gone too far and tried to make up for it in the morning. After a court injunction banning them from the main terminal building, the protesters left the airport and did not return. <laughs> the street violence expanded into train stations, disrupting the city's most popular and convenient mode of public transport. A police crackdown at Prince Edward MTR station became a defining moment, with officers storming onto a train to go after protesters. This is also a 
暴力、無理、失敗嘅行為嘅一個最大轉捩點之一嚟嘅。In terms of the Prince Edward side of things, we'd had this situation where the MTR became virtually a no-go zone for、uh, for police. Police didn't go into the MTR system. Protesters could move around wherever they wanted. And logistically, that created all sorts of problems because crowds could move very quickly from one area to another simply by using the MTR.、Um, when the police eventually went into the MTR system. Um, I think it had quite a, a positive impact on how we controlled the, the, the riots and our ability to respond to the riots. Because suddenly, with the protesters, they realised this wasn't just their sort of automatic escape route. <laughs> Anger turned against the MTR, which was accused of colluding with police against protesters using the railway network, often as an escape route. It became routine for radicals to set MTR entrances on fire, destroy ticket machines and turnstiles, and cause as much damage as possible. Train stations became tear gas-filled battlegrounds, and violence intensified all round. No law enforcement agents in the world would tolerate this sort of level of violence against the police officers. Violence used by the rioters invites forceful response, and that applies to all police officers, all police agents in the world. There are lots of people criticizing us using excessive force, but have you heard these people? Criticizing, condemning violence used by the rioters. Of course, I feel this is unfair to us. Our use of force guidelines—they basically is benchmark the international standard. This is just to tell us why the young people are choosing to use force. Because they don't know how to say the truth. But they can see it. The people are the police. The police are the police. 黃絲你係打，咁你同我講乜嘢發展啊？我相信七二一同八三一呢兩件事件係將好多中立派系嘅人士推向所謂我哋嘅黃絲派系，亦都將好多淺藍推翻去中立。藍絲就覺得誒、呃、遊行嘅人搞亂香港，令到佢哋生活唔到，於是乎就斬佢。然之後黃絲就覺得藍絲呢一班人係即係港豬，然之後又傷害佢哋，個社會徹底地去分裂。The bitter social divide would only deepen. For all sides. It was now a fight for Hong Kong's soul. In part three of China's Rebel City, the action of the police were actually kept on TV camera. They were just sent away. Actually, we are not too worried about it because we are not the only ones. 